So we're just recording the session. And if it turns out well, we're uploaded to YouTube because we have a channel called psychology at work.blog and we upload quite a bit of stuff there. So next time you have trouble sleeping, I highly recommend you head there because there's lots of stuff on personality. So today we will be talking about growth, curiosity, and I just delete the slide. Perfect. So I don't know, this was a typo. It's not supposed to be two capitals, curiosity, but hey, let's roll with it. I'm just curious. If you couldn't use the word curiosity, what words would you use? So if you can go to menti.com and type in 38, no, 378-62041 and just type it in. So 378-62041 on menti.com. And you can either open it on your phone, uh, laptop, uh, telegraph doesn't quite work, but everything else is fine. And just type in what sort of words come to mind when you see curiosity? The only thing missing in Zoom is elevator music, as far as I'm concerned. Right, so we already have one answer, waiting for a few more. Two answers, okie doke. Inquisitive. Questioning, critical thinker, explore, nosy. Nosy came out twice. Uh, intrigued, growth, lovely. Would anybody like to unmute themselves and just share with us what they wrote down or you know what stands out for them as they look at this word cloud? Just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. I put nosy in there and that was the one that I think came to mind. It's interesting that that came to mind first. And I suppose my initial, I wrote it out and then deleted it because I thought, oh, it's probably a negative connotation. But actually, I thought I'd submit it anyway, because I think it's interesting that it probably has positives and negatives in the sense that you can be nosy, where potentially um, that information is maybe not appropriate for you to know, or equally nosy and in the sense of kind of all of these positive words. So kind of to learn more, to grow. Um, you know, with the interest of using that information or whatever it is for a benefit. So yeah, that was kind of what came to mind initially. Excellent. So nosy also carries its positives and negatives. And personality is one of those fun things where you have uh, what I could term as personality relativity. So let's say if I'm really high on openness and have no boundaries, I wouldn't find a lot of questions nosy, but people who are a bit more guarded and it takes time to get to know them, maybe a little bit lower in agreeableness, higher conscientiousness. They might find questions that somebody high in openness might not find nosy, they might find nosy. So personality also might play into that. Thank you for that. Anybody else wants to chip in of what they wrote down? On, on the nosiness, Nikita, my, uh, my wife's from the south of England and shortly after we were married, she got a job in a hospital in the north of England in Leeds and she came back after a first shift and she says, the really lovely people, they ask me questions all shift about you, my mum, my dad, this and the other. And I said, no, they're just nosy buggers. <laughs> she perceived it as being very interested in her. I perceived it as being nosy. So maybe it's a reflection of your, um, your openness and uh, your sense of uh, uh, privacy. Exactly, and agreeableness. So a bit dealing with them was a little bit more suspicion. Yeah, it really works, especially when in the couple you have both. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody else? Tom, you're looking pensive. Or curious. No, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sat here with this language and thinking, but I put um, explorer. Mm -hmm. And I also put challenge as well, trying to think of something different because I've, I've heard a lot, the word a lot of challenge. And I think sometimes we see it in a very conflicting way, conflictual maybe way, and maybe curiosity can really help us see things differently and therefore perhaps challenge our thinking or, or even levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Different perspective. But how, what is that popular English phrase, curiosity killed the cat? 
Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's always interesting to see what language, you know, what the barrier where it becomes nosy or, you know, and what's acceptable level of curiosity. This is actually really interesting. And the interaction between corporate culture and personality, because to me, the way culture and personality interact is, I think culture is like guardrails. So guardrails of manifestation of your personality. So if you kind of go over the guardrails, so the culture is not that high on openness and you're a bit too curious, you'll be seen as nosy. Well, with cultures which are a bit more curious, there's a bit more leeway before you get to the guardrail. So it's also quite interesting and what's considered to be a challenge. Excellent, thank you for that, everyone. So, and another key thing with terms like curiosity, whenever I see growth mindset, curiosity, empathy, listening, all these key buzzwords that come up, even leadership, it's all presented as completely objective, verbatim, everybody knows what we're talking about, but actually everybody has their own perspective of what leadership is to them, what curiosity is to them, what is empathy to them. So I think that whenever you're working in a workshop, be it about personality or empathy or curiosity, asking the question of what word, if you couldn't use this word, what word would you use? It's quite useful. Also works really nicely with leadership. So gives you some room to play with. Okay, so we moved on to curiosity and I'm just curious, what, what do you think, what, what factors influences the way we behave as human beings? What comes to your mind? Okay, we're getting a few answers. Personality, oh, thank God somebody put it in. Last time when I did this was 50 people, nobody put down personality and I was like, damn. Uh, so environment, upbringing, social world, the situation, past experience, genetics, everything. Well, yeah, that's why they call it everything. Uh, perfect. Would anybody like to share what they wrote down? Mm -hmm. I, I put down genetic profile, um, uh, life experiences, and context. And um, uh, actually, I, I wonder what you think about like uh, a neuro, you know, divergent or diverse profile and personality. Um, what is the relationship between a less typical neurological profile? Is that a personality, or as are those separate things? Mm -hmm. Well, the fun thing in psychology, when we talk about um, constructs, is that when we correlate something, you, like a personality assessment, and let's say, or an assessment of a particular condition, um, there's usually very, very rare you get a correlation of zero. Everything is related. So to me, when we talk about personality, emotional intelligence, values, even some sorts of diagnostics, Oh, uh, after 10 years working in the field, the best way I can come up with is a metaphor. And the metaphor is no blind metaphors. The, uh, well, you love metaphors, <laughs> I hate metaphors, sorry. I hate metaphors. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, sorry, this is the best as I came up with so far. Okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Basically, the metaphor is, you know, blindfolded people touching an elephant, right? Yeah, I know. Depending on which part they touch, oh, this is hard, this is soft. They go, oh, it's a different animal but actually the same animal, we're just blindfolded to it. And I think this is the world of personality, individual assessments, because the elephant is a phenomenon of individual differences. Because we're assessing a phenomenon of what already is. It's not like we're creating something from scratch. And the phenomenon is ourselves. So we can never actually see it for what it is because it's us trying to understand ourselves. So to me, all these perspectives of, uh, some diagnostics, especially now with the dimensional model of personality disorders, which is really interesting, proposed in the most recent DSM-5. And somebody nicked my DSM-5 from the pub. Can you believe that? Well, joke is on them. They're going to be self-diagnosing all the way home. Uh, and uh, 
retribution. Uh, anyways, but uh, basically it's, it's all connected. It, it just depends how you can twist it so it'd be more understandable in a way that there's really interesting, let's say personality um, correlations with, diagnos the, uh, with uh, autism diagnostics. You can use a personality assessment to, to diagnose autism, but there's some interesting correlations there. Similarly with attention deficit hyperactivity disorders. There's also some really interesting correlations there. And then the question becomes, how do you use it? Th does that answer your question or I just went on a completely different run because I got so self-conscious you hate metaphors. Uh, sorry, sorry for uh, being a bully. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Um, well, at least good to know that nobody has a, a, a straight up answer on this. So I'm not being wrong by being a bit puzzled. Uh, usually people who have a straight answer don't have the straight answer in psychology. Okay, good. They just think they have a straight answer. Uh, yeah, I think that's worse. Uh, I, I like, uh, yeah, yeah, I prefer the other way. Um, I also uh, thought about values uh, just yesterday, um, like how your, your like neurology or personality uh, actually defines or, you know, like determines your, your values, like such as like collaboration, like, you know, I, I really, I'm not so good at, you know, like following orders and such. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if that's because of my life experiences or my genetic profile. Uh, but it surely determines my, you know, my appreciation for collaborativeness or equality uh, and such. So it's, I don't think it's something I consciously picked up by education, you know, in diversity or whatever. I just kind of feel I'm, I'm naturally like drawn towards that value. So yeah, and how, how does that relate to personality again? But it's fine, it's just a reflection. If you don't have an answer, it's fine. Well, I'm afraid we're back to the elephant because we don't yeah. really know what the <laughs> elephant is made from. It's made from genetics, yeah. nurture, because the thing is that what I absolutely love is how you can relate things. So let's say people debate nurture versus nature and you take out the verses and you put and. Yeah. And it yeah. becomes so much more fun because then they get to interact and it's, let's say, what you had predisposed with, what was encouraged in your culture and your upbringing and how it manifested in you as an adult and how it shaped your life choices. Because for example, what you mentioned to what I'm drawn to is it's a mm -hmm. fascinating thing because we don't really know what, where interest comes from. It's like what Carl Jung said, you know, your interest is your future self trying to manifest itself in the current moment. Oh, that's nice. Yes, yeah, so, and, uh, but it's, we need to give credence to our interests and pursue them. But quite often, our interests need to have, I, what's it, not a USB, damn it, that's different. I, USP. It, yeah, USP, bingo. Thank you, good sir. So you kind of need to justify in front of yourself, in front of, you know, your mind committee of like, yeah, we should pursue an education in this because it will result in so much return on investment. But sometimes you just need to pursue your interests and see what happens. So okay. within kind of context and your responsibilities. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing. And again, personality is just one of the things. So what we'll be focusing today is personality, but always keep in mind just how many other factors impact the way we behave and how we can change the way we behave depends on how much sleep we had or, you know, are we really pissed off by our spouse on this particular evening and stuff like that that can all play a part in uh, shaping our behavior. Personality is just one puzzle piece. Yeah, we, so from personality perspective, the way I kind of try to phrase it, with personality, you have three basic levels. You have trait, it's what you like, what you enjoy. You have a behavioral trait, what you do, and you have a maladaptive trait, what you do too much. And, and I feel with personality, quite often when you look at the questionnaire personality assessment, it will ask you all these questions and then it will put it into a single score. And it doesn't give you that level of differentiation. And I feel this level of differentiation is quite key because people are highly adaptable creatures. I mean, just look, you know, you, a human can be born any point in history, like for the last, what, 40,000 years and make a go of it in life from anything from building the pyramids to, to building rockets to Mars. We're highly adaptable creatures on our environment and 
our genetics and personality do not, you know, set in stone. So we're adaptable creatures from the get-go. And this way, you know, people complain, no, oh, personality is only correlated like 0.3 with performance, of course, because humans are free agents for the most part, and we can choose the way we behave. And with great power, Chrome great race responsibility, but that's Spider-Man and that's for a different day. Uh, but there's other stuff like how other people perceive you. Because if you come into a room and there's 11 people there oh, and you make him the 12th person, there's 12 versions of you and your personality. There's a self-awareness and there's a, how other people perceive you. And how they might perceive you might be shaped by their personality, culture, upbringing, and your behaviors they interpret. Because ultimately, other people judge you on your behavior. And uh, this is why I really like a quote by Kurt Vonnegut. We are the people who we pretend to be, so be really careful who you pretend to be. And uh, so when it comes to, you know, oh, thank you. I appreciate a little bit of hard validation. Ego needs love too. Uh, and so it's important to look at personality as something that you have a preference, a layer that you have a behavior, maladaptive response, and also how other people perceive you, which might be in turn shaped in, to an extent by their personality. So that's, uh, and another quick caveat, because we're gonna be talking about percentiles, how you set yourself up against the population, let's say I'm 95 percentile neurotic. So on a neuroticism scale, I score within the top 5% of the population. And when we see numbers, uh, we need to look at how we perceive numbers around us. We usually perceive numbers, you know, as centimeters or scales, set number, universal, more or less. And therefore, when we see psychometrics, we might give them that the same level of immobility, you know, the same level of setness. So therefore, we might think that psychometrics and personality assessments are like putting your head on a pair of scales. By the way, scales and psychometrics go way back. Uh, when Cattell, not 16PF Cattell, the other Cattells, there were two Cattells in the world of psychometrics in 20th century, a bit confusing, but the Cattell, the first one, proposed to set up the first laboratory of psychometrics in Cambridge University. And the Senate or the committee of Cambridge told them to go whistle Dixie because they said, what you are proposing here is an abomination. You're proposing to put a human soul on a pair of scales. Uh, but then he had a mate who was running the physics laboratory and he was like, can I have a corner? And he was like, yeah, sure. So he set up uh, the Cambridge Psychometric Testing Center, which is still there uh, back in the physics laboratory in Cambridge. So I highly recommend if you want to know more about this, the Psychometric Testing Center in Cambridge has a wonderful web page of their history. And it's quite, it's quite a diamond to read from perspective. So if it's not kind of this fixed numbers, I, I see psychometrics as squishy numbers uh, because if it's affected by so many different things as we just noted, then, bingo, then it is that squishiness, it is that flexibility, it is the interaction between nurture and nature that really plays a part. So before we dive into the growth and fixed mindsets, before, we already identified that curiosity, there's different perspectives on this. We said about personality, it's not set in stone, it's not definitive, and there's a lot of other things affecting the way we behave. Any questions so far? As a high extrovert, whenever I ask any questions, you'll notice I count to 10 inside my head because my default setting is any questions, good, moving on. Uh, so, yeah, that's 10 seconds. So the model we'll be using for this is the big five. Now, big five is a magic number. You might have heard the song, you know, three is a magic number. It's a big five, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But what's really important to note, it's for now. Because the world of personality assessments is a fun one. Because you have personality assessment publishers who are commercial well, for most part. And you also have personality psychology. So you have a scientific discipline. Depends if you can consider psychology as science. I still have debates with my dad. He's a professor of applied mathematics and physics, but we won't go into it. Uh, and uh, but the key thing here is though, 
we have, it's a scientific discipline. So our understanding is growing based on the research that we're doing. So for now, we think it's a big five. Maybe in the future, it would be big six, big seven, maybe we'll go back to three, who knows? That's the benefit of a scientific process. Your knowledge keeps evolving. So the big five basically says that in the human language that we use, there are five points of gravity around which words that are used to describe personality center around. Let's say all the words with negative emotional affect, anger, hostility, settle around neuroticism, uh, positivity, op kind of like need for stimuli, extroversion. Openness is all about curiosity and exploration and agreeableness, you know, how friendly you are with others outside of your immediate circle and conscientiousness is the strength of drive and purpose. So uh, what I would like you to, um, hmm, there's a little button called annotate on Zoom. So if you go to the top, of the shared screen, there's a little drop down menu and you can click annotate and it gives you like little stamps you can use. So if you could just quickly maybe stamp a few stamps uh, of what do you, what quality, wh which one of the five aspects or factors or domains that has to do mostly with like growth mindset curiosity. Oh, we have quite a few immediately onto openness. Hmm. Somebody put a tab on neuroticism. Would you mind unmuting yourself and sharing with us? Why? Hi, uh, I chose that. Um, I think the hyper uh, neurotic mind is always looking out for something. It's more curious. I think always um, thinking about catastrophe, what could go wrong, hypervigilant could be related to curiosity, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's um, I, I really like this quote uh, by Bernard Shaw. Society needs both optimists and pessimists. Optimists build the airplane, the pessimists build the parachute. So if you're high also in neuroticism and openness, you're more likely to watch out for risks and be quite creative of how things can go wrong. Because the thing is that people often think, you know, Curiosity is this imagination, you know, it's rainbows and leprechauns and pots of gold and, you know, all that good stuff. Hey, man, imagination does not judge. If you're highly neurotic and imaginative, man, that's like nightmare fuel. You can imagine things going bad really, really quick and in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. So if you're high neuroticism and openness, you know, you're quite high on the watch out. But sometimes, you know, it's hard to look for a black cat in a dark room, especially when there is no cat. So sometimes you might imagine things which are not really there, uh, which is also quite interesting trying to explain it to people. But what I found, if you're high in openness and neuroticism, I have found people who are highly successful in corporate life, especially if they work in risk departments. So if you have risk next to your job title and you're high on openness neuroticism, you seem to be using it more as a strength than most people. But thank you for that point. And there is actually quite a strong correlation between neuroticism and openness uh, in assessments. Just Perfect. So would anybody else like to chime in as to what they tagged? Nikita. So I started doing little green ticks next things and then realized I kind of want to want to put one next to all five, mm -hmm. um, which made me think that they're all potential links to curiosity. It just depends on how you're seeing it as a driver. So conscientiousness, if you really want to understand and to be successful, it might be that that fuels an interest in curiosity and wanting to ask questions or find out more, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. So I think all of these different aspects could lead quite naturally as a driver to curiosity, but they don't, I mean, apart from the fact that openness has curiosity in the definition, um, the rest of them could equally link really nicely to it, but I imagine it could work the opposite way around depending on other factors. Exactly, and this brings us to a wonderful point about the other side. So let's, thank you for those illustrations. There's one of the key things is a two-factor model of personality. 
So when we correlate the big five, we get stability and plasticity. So stability is high agreeableness, conscientiousness, and low neuroticism. And plasticity is high extroversion and openness. They're referred to as a meta factors of personality or alpha and beta, if you fancy going into Google Scholar. And to me, this is where we come to probably one of the, how can I put it? To an extent, neatest overlays between personality psychology and uh, concepts popular in popular psychology, in particular growth and fixed mindset. Because to me, plasticity associated with openness, extroversion is a, is a very good way, overlay of growth mindset. It's exploration, it's challenging, it's, you know, going forwards and exploring the unknown. And stability is a very good illustration of fixed mindset, but that's not a bit cl clear because fixed is usually appreciated as negative and plasticity as uh, growth is positive. So let's add the same as we do with personality, you know, underlying what you like every day, what you do, overextended what you do too much. So let's add an effective level and a maladaptive level. So if we have an effective level, we have growth mindset, perfect, it's adaptive, but let's rename fix to like nurture mindset because we have growth, which is all about innovation, but innovation is useful, useless without implementation because you need somebody to build it, right? You need somebody to grow those relationships, to build the business. So to me, you have plasticity, which is growth or innovation, and you have stability, which is nurture innovation. And you need both of them working together to actually manifest something. And this is a key thing because this is how personality, because the big five, but we use terms like neuroticism, etc. it values everything equally. It should do that. Uh, and therefore, if we apply a personality framework to things like growth mindset, curiosity, it gives us more of a balanced perspective in my view. And this is why it's important to combine both of them. So as we continue, uh, a model that illustrates this really nicely, uh, well, in my humble opinion, is Luminous Spark. Uh, and I, I see Nikki, you're entertained by that, but to me, because Lumina combines uh, in itself, you know, uh, it's based on the big five cross-cultural research, but it overlays with type-based model, disc-based model, color-based models. Because to me, a good model, if it's a build on history, needs to incorporate what was done in the past and then build on it. And this does this. And the model is really basic. You have basically the 24 qualities on the outside, such as traits, each measured independently, be it collaborative or flexible, but the positioning is based on correlations. So we know if, let's say, you're highly take charge and likely to speak up, whether you go to Japan or Canada, you're least likely to listen. Surprise, surprise. Not impossible, you can do both, but it's unlikely. What's more likely to happen if you like to speak up? You're also likely to be more expressive emotionally, and you're more likely to stand your ground tough. So the model is basic. It, it, everything is next to a statistical neighbor, opposite a statistical opposite, measured independently. So one time I had a client who scored 99th percentile structured and 99th percentile flexible. And I was like, how does this work? Because it's so simple, I don't know why you ask. I keep very detailed agendas and diaries, that's structured, but I keep them in pencil, that's flexible. So to him, this was completely normal. He just couldn't understand why everybody else couldn't keep one foot in chaos, one foot in order. Jeez, imagine that. So we all have our own paradoxes and we all have one-sided preferences. And then we take the 24 qualities and we make eight aspects of it, such as sociable demonstrative take charge makes up extroversion and observing measured intimate makes up introversion. And again, it's measured separately. And this to me addresses one of the greatest debates in personality psychology, trait versus type. Jesus, seriously, the amount of beer I spilled in Brighton once arguing about trait versus type was horrendous. Uh, and, uh, but basically it's trait and type. Basically the issue is that let's say if you try to pa parallel 
I apologize for anybody who this is too geeky for. Please have a cup of coffee at the people in the chat. Just allow me this two minutes of geekiness. So uh, if you have um, somebody who scores really high on extroversion, really low introversion, the definition of an E applies really well to them. If you have somebody high on introversion, really low uh, on extroversion, the definition of an I applies really well to that. So type is really good for exploring polar preferences and personality in my experience, really good for it. Uh, however, quite a few people score in the middle. So quite a few people are ambiverts. They're a mix of the two. So with a model that measures both sides, it's trait on most things, but everybody has a bit of type, such as, for example, you might be really high intuition, really low sensing, or really high uh, openness, really low down to earth, or you might be a bit of both. So to me, it's trait and type. And you have this eight aspects. And the best bit, everything is based on correlations. So when we crack the data and we look at the correlations in it, so for example, discipline driven and down to earth is correlated 0.54, which is interesting in itself. But in psychology, we don't like correlations beyond 0.4. It's a little bit too close, a little bit too incestuous, a little bit too Game of Thrones. Uh, and uh, because we need like separate constructs, uh, if they're above 0.4, just a little bit too close. So might be the same thing. So, but it's really hard to create items, really hard to create items. We didn't know this until we started no, with a recent validation, uh, which load more on low openness than conscientiousness. So if you create items measuring low openness, they seem to have a really strong pull towards high conscientiousness. And we don't really know what's going on there. But it's really interesting just to think if we like praise conscientiousness in corporate environments so much, what's the impact on openness? So yeah, but that's a different story. But what's really cool here is we have a break in the model, 0 0.14, 0 0.11 here. So the model breaks into two. So you have high extroversion and high openness on one side. So that's stability, no, plasticity. And then you have high agreeableness, high conscientiousness on the stability side. But what I find really cool is not only do we have, let's say, high extroversion, high openness here, we also have the opposites of stability, low agreeableness, low conscientiousness. And here, we don't only have low, uh, um, whew, high conscientiousness and high agreeableness. We also have low extroversion or introversion, and we have low openness down to earth. So it's, it's a really nice clean break. So to me, you have the growth mindset, nurturing mindset. And then with Spark, and this is where it really gets interesting. We have how the other side might perceive you under stress. So under pressure, people who are highly big picture thinking might be perceived by the pragmatic people as unfeasible fantasists and change for the sake of change. And those free agents who read so many growth mindset books, which told them they're right, see people as down to earth, as lost in detail, change resistant, narrow sighted, fixed mindset. And this is where team dynamics come in, which are so interesting. So let's say if two people high on openness, high on growth mindset, go and create a presentation they're gonna deliver to a more wider public of let's say engineers who tend to score a little bit more on the pragmatic side. They're gonna have a great time designing this presentation. But when they come to present, it lands like a lead balloon. And what do they do with it? They go back to the pub and say, oh, they have a fixed mindset. Yeah, I know. Seriously, did you read this book? Oh, I hear that guy proposed infinite mindset. Oh, we should definitely read that. Rather than actually, how can you communicate in a way that people understand? There's not a lot of point to your ideas if the other people don't hear them. And it's like, you know, and it's so interesting because people high on plasticity, that high extroversion, low agreeableness, they tend to be fast paced. So if these people keep asking them nitpicking questions like, come on, just crack on with it. They don't understand it, man. Like until they understand, but I explained to them this, but they don't get it. You, you, we need to co-create then the strategies. Uh, and yeah, similarly people here just go, they're just another planet. They don't understand their concerns. So the basic summary 
of today's talk is that if we keep see seeing things as positive and negative, such as growth and fixed, and only that, it's a pretty fixed way of looking at things. And we actually increase maladaptive chances of maladaptive behavior because we prioritize one over the other. So it's important to value both sides and acknowledge both sides can be overdone. But as previously mentioned, because of this strange relationship between down to earth and discipline driven and conscientiousness and the role of culture as far as what traits are acceptable and desirable within the company, actually championing things like curiosity, growth mindset can have its value by broadening the horizon and expansion. But it's just as long as we give enough love and respect to the other side. So yeah, that's a summary. Any thoughts, questions, reflections? We still have a bit of time to chat. Um, I have a question just to get your view on. What would your thoughts be? I know that a lot of this is obviously from a, an individual perspective. But in terms of making up teams, because obviously most environments are um, kind of teams generating ideas, projects, that sort of stuff. Would your view be then that actually having a balance, um, not necessarily in terms of equal numbers of people, but a balance of some people who are more stability focused, some people who are more plasticity would be, um, I don't want to say ideal, but but you know what I mean, kind of a, a good healthy balance to get generate the ideas, but then also actually be able to implement them and avoid risks and all that sort of stuff. I see that that's a good question. Um, from my perspective, it's um, more about the importance of respect towards all the different personality traits to begin with. And two, um, there's a good guy, Ron Warren. He, he's an interesting personality psychology, has a tool called LMAP360 and a good book. He says the role of a leader in today's environment is to facilitate collective intelligence. And I really like this terminology because the world is far too complex and unpredictable for any person to make it on their own. Uh, and therefore, how you can facilitate the collective intelligence and also diversity of perspectives. Because my anecdotal evidence and uh, opinion is that if you work in a highly predictable environment, actually having similar personality traits within the group can be advantageous, can be because you see the world in the same way. You understand each other from half a word. You know, you're on the same page more often than not. But it's extremely dangerous to have that similarity when the environment starts changing because you might not notice a change because you keep reassuring each other the world isn't changing and we're right and they're wrong. So therefore diversity of perspective becomes really important. But then the question is how you facilitate the diversity of personality within the team environment. So for example, which traits are rewarded? Which traits are looked down upon? And also what sort of a common pattern there is? So quite often this might be informed by, you know, remuneration, you know, individual performance, group performance, et cetera. Also leaders' personalities are quite enigmatic and uh, so might form a little cult around them. That tends to happen as well. And th therefore these factors need to be taken into account. But the main thing is, is respect to your opposites. Because if you have a team high on growth mindset and they're really innovative, really out there, if they can't explain it to a wider team and they think that none of this discipline, down to earth, introversion has any value, that's more problematic. But if they really value the technical experts to whom they hand over the process, so when they created their idea, they give it over to the more technical people in a way they can understand and co-create it and do, do it properly. That's uh, what's really important. And quite often we focus on growth and fixed mindsets and we actually forget the most important is how, how they communicate, how can they respect each other, how they can meet each other halfway. Because as the ancient Chinese proverb on Facebook said, so it's not, you know, it's true, that there's 10 steps between every two people and it's up to each one to make five. So it's how we can meet in the middle of how we can make the best of both worlds. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. I think it's, um, it's really interesting to kind of think about how this applies to, as from an individual perspective, but how that kind of um, spreads out when you're looking at teams and kind of the makeup of teams. And yeah, I agree about diversity. And um, just to build on that, um, there's also the level of uh, what I call uh, uh, personality symbiotics. 
And this is what happens when two people work together for extended periods of time with opposite personalities. And they come to rely upon each other. So let's say if somebody is really off the scale on plasticity and somebody is really off the scale on stability, they might have got together and been working closely together. And the way they find out, let's say, person who presents high on plasticity, just roughly speaking, turns to the person high on stability the day before a big presentation to go through it with them to add the detail and make it pragmatic. Similarly, person high on stability might turn to the person high on plasticity if they need a second opinion or broaden their perspective or get a more strategic thought. And it's wonderful, they work together beautifully. But the issue is that if what one of them gets recruited as a high performer to a different organization, and then spectacularly derails there. And they feel quite miffed because they joined as a high performer. Look what they did at our competitors. And uh, they're doing what they did, but it's not getting the result. And then you ask them to quickly draw the personality of their closest colleague in the previous place. And it's like, oh, there you go. There's something we need to take into account. Any other thoughts or questions about plasticity, stability, curiosity? So how does one become more plastic? Mm -hmm. And is that even the right question to ask? Tom, so why, why do you want to become more plastic? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess if one if one considers development to be an individual activity, which again has its limitations, um, but may, maybe maybe the way that we frame and think about development is is too much from an I perspective. So I guess my question is, how can we how do we best use something like Lumina in service of development when the aim is at a organizational level? I see. So first of all, we need to identify what we want to develop. So let's say if you want to develop big picture thinking and creativity, if you want to change your personality, which you can, one good way to start this is changing your habits. So you might explore A, what has helped this person to be creative in the past and what's their definition of creativity. Such as people high on plasticity can be really creative if they have time if they have a clear goal and the problems they're solving. <laughs> so if they need more detail of why they're being creative to begin with, that can be helpful. Um, another key thing is you need to have a spotter because let's say if you're used to doing something for 20, 30 years of your life in a certain way and being known for this, it will, even if you start changing your behavior, it will take time for your self-construct to catch up. So you need some, outside stimuli to spot you. So one of the key things I usually, when let's say we do a team session, people say, I wanna develop this in my next three months. And I ask them, what should the team members look out for to acknowledge? And say, well, you know, we'll be sharing more ideas, etc." It's really important the team members say, ah, you're doing this more. And the analogy I give is going to the gym when we can go to the gym now, I'm not going anyways. But uh, if you, start going to the gym and been going for a month and you don't notice any changes because you're used to your body image and changes are gradual. And you go, why am I doing this? I'm paying 70 quid a month. I joined for a hundred quid. Why am I doing this? Until somebody unprompted say, you have been going to the gym, haven't you? And you're like, yes, I have. And I'm off there again because it gives you that reinforcement and acknowledgement because of our basic need to be seen. And that's more likely to change. And I think a lot of behavioral change fails to an extent because of a lack of a spotter, because we can't even notice we're changing because we're so used to our own self-construct. Uh, that's, what are your thoughts, Tom, on that? Yeah, I, de I definitely like this, the idea of, of habits and building on and having that, that person, that, that language of spotter, I think certainly, yeah, I think we often focus in on the front end of diagnosing the, the, the challenge, the problem, the issue, as it were, and then saying, and here's a whole bunch of ideas that you could do. I think actually the behavior change takes place when we get, we focus more on the environment 
and, and the spotter is part of that reinforcement is part of that habit you know getting people into good habits to make those small adjustments is part of that yes absolutely and it's one percent at a time you know if you could wake up with a different personality tomorrow that'd be a medical condition uh but uh, if it comes to change personality it has to be really gradual and you might be surprised at what changes it makes and to me when i'm working with a client if let's say they're really low and structured so really disorganized really to them even being 10 20 percent more organized can be a huge impact on their lives huge because it's the lowest quality currently so it it is identifying sometimes in the lowest quality of your preference lies the biggest opportunity for development and biggest return on investment as well as far as energy. So like, you know, writing down three things you're going to do today in the morning or, you know, the moment you sense, uh, make a meeting, send a calendar invite, little things like that can go a really long, different, a long way. Similarly, if people who always interrupt, even if they stop interrupting, even if they don't really listen, really might be beneficial. Any other questions or thoughts before I put you into a little breakout room for reflections and chatting? Because you know, I love talking to myself, but not everybody does. I think Galeen's put something very interesting in the chat. Right. Thanks for the spot, Tom. That's what spotters are for. Yeah. Let me just get that. Oh, Nikita, me... sorry, Nikita, sorry, please could you repeat the Mentimeter code to, to see this PowerPoint? Oh, sorry. Oh, of course. So let me just find it. Yeah, it's 3786 2041. Thank you. No worries. Yes, so uh, Garlene, would you mind to unmute yourself and share with us? Yes. So Nikita, I have been an MBTI and a Gallup Strengths fan, and I've been taught that personality is relatively fixed and you become more of who you already are and we should focus on strengths and not our weaknesses. But over time I've realized, and especially with growth mindset and you know that brain is neuroplastic and you can be and learn anything you want, irrespective of who you are. And like you said, you can probably develop new habits through habit formation and through practicing it every day. So will it change my personality? So I'm right now I'm confused. So whenever I go to corporates, because I'm a trainer, I, whenever I go to corporates, I am actually preaching people to be, oh, you know, more growth mindset oriented. But at the same time, and I, I know that personality is relatively fixed. And like you said, especially in MBTI, if you're an extreme personality, then it is very difficult for you to change. So I don't know how to make sense of all of that. Mm. Yeah. Well, both of them exist. It's fixed and it isn't. So the key thing here is that you mentioned as we grow older, our personality becomes more fixed. The, one of the arguments for it is we become more set in our habits. So our personality becomes more fixed. So therefore, if people, for example, there's interesting uh, area of coaching of where people relocate to other locations and other cultures and set up their lives again. And personality can, apparently, I have never read a study on it. But the coaches I talk to say personality can change and you have like a sweet spot until you can actually change a few things before you fall back into your new old habits in a new place. So that in itself is quite interesting. And I think that it's not about personality change as much as personality growth. So to me, I believe you can grow your personality, you can develop it. Uh, but the question is, you know, what the benefits of this? Is it the best way to use your resources? And, uh, uh, and most importantly, maybe you can work more effectively with somebody who already has it so you can play to each other's strengths. But I believe you can change your personality, you can develop it uh, because otherwise, why not? <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, if personality was fixed, we would have much more correlation with performance, I think would have it'd be much more predictive of performance and it might be more predictive of other things but the fact it isn't that predictive just shows how much leeway we actually have in developing it and working with it 
So to me, l lack of correlation with performance in psychometric assessments, in some, you know, it still needs to be valid and reliable. It's not necessarily a critique of a personality assessment discipline. It's more a testament to human adaptability. Just on that, Nikita, you're talking about the three different levels. You've yeah. got your kind of underlying preferences, mm -hmm. as well as your behaviors, how they show up, and then what that could look like if it's maladaptive or overextended. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a distinction between how fixed the natural preferences may be versus the behaviors that we adapt to. Mm -hmm. and and show, which might have an impact because if you realize that actually a different behavior is giving you results that you really like and you can see a different perspective your preferences may also change um but i wonder if maybe that's part of where the distinction is yeah exactly so sometimes by trying things it might be good uh, you know you might like it with time and you might see how effective it is uh so that's also true as far as Lumina research, we actually haven't found such a big difference in um, test retest and underlying and every day as we'd expect. They're actually quite similar. Maybe underlying is slightly higher in test retest, but there's still that flexibility. But I also just want to say that it's nothing new, sadly can't claim the credit for it because I was doing a workshop and somebody, and I was talking about this plasticity, stability. And so like, this is nothing new. And I was like, what, what, what? And they said, oh, mate, it's just yin and yang. And I was like, oh. so I checked this out and oh my God, I misspelled yin. Anyways, uh, but it's, you have the yang, you have the yin, shadow and light. It's an interaction of both. And it's the dynamic of them that counts. And the one carries the seed of the other. And I was thinking about how does this apply to personality? And I was like, well, you need both sides. You need extroversion and introversion. Because if we didn't have introversion, we just have eh, because we wouldn't need any extroversion definition. So you need both. And the question of balance. And they also mentioned that you can overdo it. So overdoing yang is chaos, ying is frozen, which is similar to fixed as well. So there's that interesting parallels. But then I got digging a little bit deeper. And you know what's really fun with the big five? You have the structure of big five, big two, big one in personality. And when you look at the yin and yang, it has big one, the true self. Then you have yin and yang. And then you have five elements, like earth, wind, fire, water. And I was like, wow, man, same ar architectural structure of personality based on you know the big five from the 80s or yin and yang, which is depending on which Wikipedia entry you read is like a thousand years old. Uh, so I, I just thought this is like a really interesting synchronicity. Well, that's pretty much it from me. And um, yeah, that's, that's some other stuff. So on that note, I would like to thank you for your participation and uh, hopefully see you next time. But for now, I'm just gonna stop the share and bingo and stop recording.